Hello everyone. So welcome to this session about scientific data management given by Damien Francois. So thanks a lot. Uh, thanks Damien for the presentations and the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivier. So uh, welcome to this session. The goal of this session is uh, threefold is to share tools, tips and tricks related to the storage, the transfer and uh, sharing of uh, data and scientific data in particular. So uh, it will not be a comprehensive tutorial on all the subjects, rather a catalog of tools and concepts that uh, you might find useful when using the clusters. Uh, it will be very similar to the session about developing and deploying software if you attended it uh, earlier. So we'll talk about storage, about transfer and about sharing. And the first item is uh, storage. And in the storage part, we will talk a bit about the file systems, the object stores and the databases. So the file systems, I'm sure you are familiar with it. The fact that files are organized into directories and folders. Uh, this is how it works on the clusters. But nowadays, uh, more and more, we see that object stores, which were initially developed for the web, are coming towards the HPC world. So I will have a few words about them. And also databases with the old big data things, they have become an uh, integral part of the clusters nowadays, even if the CC does not offer uh, currently databases. It is something that you might find useful in uh, your uh, daily work. So uh, just a few words about the technology behind the storage. Uh, the technologies have a trade-off between the performances and the uh, size of the data that they can store. And so here on the diagram, you see a um, performance price per gigabyte uh, graph. And you see here the CPU SD RAM is the most uh, performant type of memory, but it's also the smallest one. So because it's very expensive and it's located inside the CPU. At the other end of the spectrum, you have tapes, uh, tapes which are very cheap per gigabyte. And so with tape, you can store a very large amount of data. And even though tapes uh, is a very old technology, it's uh, often used a lot still nowadays because it's so cheap. But then the performances are very weak, are very low. So with a tape, <clears throat> you need a robot that takes the tape and puts it in a reader and then access the data. And it takes a long time but you can store petabytes and petabytes of data. In between, you have the memory, so the random access memory in your computer, and you know that you can have up to uh, 16 or 32 gigabytes on your laptop and up to one or two terabytes on the clusters. Uh, this is very expensive per gigabyte, but it's also very fast, but it's volatile. As soon as you stop the, um, the power, you lose the information in there. And then here you have the uh, hard drives, uh, so where the data can be stored in, uh, in the long term. A bit more expensive than tapes, uh, but also faster. And in between you have SSDs, two types of SSDs, SATA and PCIe. Um, and they are midway between the hard drives, which we call also spinning hard drives because they are mechanical parts that run, that turn in the in the hard drives and the, the memory. The, the, so the SSD has technology very similar to the memory, uh, which is flash. So just to show you the spectrum of types of memory that you can have on a computer and by extension on a cluster. So back to storage and storage paradigms. First, I will uh, talk a bit about the four types of paradigms you can have when you want to store information or store data. The first is file systems. This is the one you are certainly uh, familiar with. You know that on your drive, you can store files into directories or folders as Windows call it. Um, and you know that uh, there are some information associated to each file such as a owner, a permissions, uh, and so on. This is the type of storage that everyone knows. So I see a question about the previous slide. What is NVMe and where does it stand in the graph? So NVMe is here, the PCIe SSD uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the 
technology that is used in NVMe, uh, uh, sorry, in NVMe disks. So PCIe is the, the hardware technology, and NVMe is a protocol that runs on the uh, PCIe uh, connection. So back to uh, here, I said earlier that object stores are coming closer and closer to the clusters, and they uh, look like actually file systems in the sense that they can store information. Uh, but the main difference here from the user's point of view is that you can uh, associate arbitrary metadata with the files so or with the data that you store. And then you are able to query the metadata by itself. That is the most different, the most important aspect from the user's point of view. From the backend's point of view, from the administrators, the technology is completely different and it has a large number of advantages, uh, such as redundancy and uh, uh, high availability, which is built in the system. Uh, and also, it's a bit different in terms of uh, uh, type of access. The object stores is really designed to have one copy and multiple reads, while the file system is meant to have a regular amount of copies and, and, read and reads. So object stores are, are a bit uh, recent technology compared to file systems. Uh, and here I'm showing you the relational database system, which is also an old technology. And in there, data is stored into tables and tables are organized with links between them. So it's highly structured and you have query languages where you can ask the server, give me this or that information. And then the fourth time, which is also uh, more recent than the relational database system, is what we call the NoSQL for NoSQL or not only SQL, uh, which is a type of databases. And actually, it's a set of types of databases where you can store data in a way which is uh, highly structured or actually unstructured, but in a way which is uh, more suited for what you want to do. You can have key values where it works a bit like a dictionary, Python, if you know what this is, or document-based, um, very similar to, to uh, uh, MongoDB or CoachDB or whatever, for those who know it. Uh, you can have column databases, which are more suited for the uh, type of data in the scientific world is coping with, and then graph base where you can store actually graph objects, uh, but I will come back to that a bit later. So first we will focus on file systems, just to make sure that um, everyone understands exactly how it works. Uh, file system is a very old technology, but at the, at the very uh, first generation, and we call it the generation zero, there were no file system at all, meaning that the data was stored mostly on tapes, uh, as a stream of data, and you had to know exactly what was on the on the what type of data was on the on the tape before you were able to read it and interpret it. And then uh, the uh, uh, technology evolved, and you see that the second generation you have name files that appeared because at the beginning there were no name file there was no name file at all just the random data, and then name file name file appears and then folders or directories appears in generation two and then generation three so the uh, appearance of metadata so ownership who owns the files among all of the unix users on the on the system uh, and uh, permissions so either read write or readable for the user or for the work that kind of stuff and then ge generation four is the most current type of uh, file system nowadays. If you have a Linux uh, system, you mo most probably have X4 or XFS installed on it. Uh, it is a journal file system, which is a system that allows uh, making sure that in the event of a power cut or a kernel crash, the content of the disk stays consistent. So you don't, leave, you don't lose the entire content. You might lose the file that was being written uh, at the time of the crash, but you will not lose the other things. And then the most current generation, the ger generation five, uh, have very nice features. I will not explain them, uh, but the two main 
products here are BetterFS and ZFS, and ZFS is the one that we use on most clusters for the home directories, for instance. Okay, so all these uh, file systems are local to a disk, so it means that they are installed on one disk in one computer. But you know that you can have one disk that needs to be available from many more computers, so there are two, two technologies here. One is NFS, and uh, it's used to do what we call uh, network attached servers. So you have a server with a set, uh, often a large number of disks attached to it. And then through the network, it, the server delivers the files to the machines that are attached to it. So typically in a cluster, you have a home directory, or besides a cluster, you have mass storage. It's all implemented as a network file system with a NAS. This is another type of technology, which is a bit different, but the goal is the same. It's much more used in uh, uh, the cloud environments and for virtual machines. So here we have one uh, server, one offer, one server that offers the data and multiple clients that consume the data or access the data. But you can also have multiple servers hosting the data giving them access to multiple users. And so here again, there are two uh, types of system, the one which are equivalent to the uh, NFS file systems and the one which are equivalent to the SAN file system. Uh, and here you see that you have multiple computers attached to multiple uh, disks that offer access to multiple compute uh, servers and here on the cluster, these are the compute nodes and these are the servers that hold the scratch space, for instance. So examples are Luster, as we had on the Metro 2, uh, GPFS, BGFS, as we have on NIC4 and uh, Metro 3, and ClusterFS. So all of these are networked file systems, so they work through the network. You have machines that offer access to the file system and machines that mount the file system to be able to access the files that are stored on the remote machines. There's another type of file system that I uh, will talk about. It's uh, uh, in-memory file systems. Uh, TMPFS is a type of file system that actually does not reside on a disk or on a remote server, but rather in memory. So it's a kind of file system which is very fast, as we saw the, the graph with the uh, memory and, and the, the performances, but it's volatile. So as soon as you lose a power, you, you lose it. But if at some point you need a very fast file system for temporary data, TMPFS is a type of file system that you find useful. So if I just show you on the method three, so the method three has two management nodes. It has a large storage bay with large number of disks and, multi and four you see here one, two, three, four uh, servers for storing the scratch system. You have the home file system with two servers, which you cannot see on the picture because they are at the back of the system. And then you have the uh, compute nodes here and here the switch. So the two management system have an XFS file system, which is shared by both and exported with an FS to the file system here to the machines here, and it's used mainly for the software. Uh, the home file system here is based on NFS to export the, the data towards the compute nodes, and the NFS sits on top of ZFS, ZFS. And on the compute node, you see that there's an XFS file system, which is really local to the node uh, with only the disk that is on the node. So just to show you that on a single cluster, we have multiple file systems available. And this uh, uh, afternoon session by Arya will expand this a bit more. So back to the method three, if you run the df command on the method three, which is the command that allows you to see what storage systems are available on the cluster, you see uh, here the output of the, this command. So I just exclude the temporary file system because there is a huge list of temporary file systems. Uh, basically, uh, Linux will create one for every user that connects. Uh, but then you see that there are different types of uh, file systems here. 
you see this one and this one directly corresponds to partitions on the disk. So this is uh, partition two on disk A, and this is partition one on disk A. Uh, you see also this kind of mounting. So this is uh, the device mapper, the logical volume mapper in Linux, which is the more modern way to export the access to the disk to the machine, uh, other than directly accessing it, like with a slash SDE and so on. And then if you see those lines, they are uh, built as a colon separated a string with the name of the computer and then the name of a path. And these are all NFS exports. So you see that the machine LM3-N exports its slash storage system and it's mounted, as we say, on the current machine as slash home. So the main point here is the, uh, the, the, the location in the uh, directory structure where the information or the directories offered by those by those systems is attached. So you know that in Windows, when you add a disk, it comes with a new letter with a C, D, E, and so on. On Linux, it's just getting attached at, at some location in the uh, file system directories and uh, in the hierarchy. Here you see also another type of uh, file system, which is BGFS for the scratch, and you see that it has a, a name which is specific to the file system driver that is installed. So this uh, DF command actually shows you the uh, usage and the amount of free space that we have on the cluster. But if you specify the dash, the dash I option, like here, uh, actually it shows you the number of I nodes that are used and that are free. Because when you fill data on a disk, you consume volume that is intuitive, but you also consume what I call uh, I nodes. And the I nodes are part of the structure that explain the logical uh, structure of the of the data on the disk. So just a few words about I nodes because it's important. Uh, oftentimes we we uh, fill disks with I nodes and we have issues with that on the clusters. So if you look at the disk. It's split into partitions, so you see in the previous slide SDA1, SDA2, so SDA is the disk, and then SDA1 is one partition, second partition, SDA3 would be a third partition. Each partition is uh, split into zones, and then each zone is split into uh, a super block that uh, identifies the zone, and then uh, you see that there are data bitmap and blocks and inode bitmap and blocks. So this is where the data is stored. This is where the inode are stored. And these are just bitmaps to show which uh, inode or which data block is uh, free. So if you have a home directory that has foo and bar files in them, the file system holds a reference to an inode. So the foo file uh, has a uh, uh, is linked to inode one to three, for instance, and in the inode, what we see, we see, we see the metadata, so the group owner, the owner ID and the group ID, sorry, you see the permissions, so um, either word readable, word writable, group readable, group writable, and so on. You see that there's information about the type of file. It could be a regular file, it could be a directory, it could be a sibling link, it could be a FIFO. Um, so all types of files that are available on the Linux system. And then you have links to data blocks. And in the inode, you have links to multiple data blocks, which, you, which is where the uh, data actually is uh, stored. So just like the volume in Gigabyte is limited on a file system, the number of inode is also limited on file systems, for most file systems, uh, for performance reasons. And so on the clusters, you have quota both on the volume and on the number of inodes. And the more uh, files you create, it, you create the more inodes you consume. So this was a, a bit of a, an explanation of all the file systems that you can find uh, on or near a cluster. What file system to use for which usage? That you can refer to this graph 
uh, to decide. So as I said earlier, the uh, TMPFS in memory uh, has a high uh, output output performances, but you cannot store large files. You see on this axis, uh, which is a file size, uh, it's very low because um, it's restricted by the memory. Also, it's volatile, so as soon as you uh, lose the power, you lose the information that is there. The local scratch are used, are uh, available on the cluster on each compute node. It's considered unsafe because there's only one disk and there is no redundancy built in on the system most of the time. Uh, but it's uh, pretty fast compared to the home file systems, which are more redundant because you have a large number of disks organized in a red system where if one disk fails, you can swap it with another disk, a brand new one, and you don't even lose a um, service. You can do that without any user notif noticing. Uh, but as it has to go through the network, it's uh, slower than a local scratch. And then you have the global scratch, which is uh, the file system where you can store large amount of data because here you are limited on the local scratch by the size, the physical size of the disk. And on the home file systems, you are limited by the quota that are set for users so that everyone has access to a fair amount of the space there. On the, local, on the global scratch, you don't have quotas most of the time, but at the same time, uh, we ask people to clean after themselves. So if you are using this space area to store large files, when you are done, you are supposed to to, uh, to scratch to scratch to scratch the data. And if you need to, um, if you need to to keep the data for a long time, then you should store it on the mass storage where you can have uh, very large files also, but it's not um, very fast because the connection to the uh, cluster is a bit different. So there was a question um, about the networks. Is it fiber or copper? It depends. So if I take back my uh, description of limit three, you see here the lines uh, uh, explain the color. So inside the cluster, you have the uh, Omnipath, which is limited to 60 gigabits per second. It's a large number, but uh, it still is less than the performances that you can expect from uh, NVMe on a, on a single node. Also due to the, to the complexity of the NFS file system, that has to manage the fact that multiple uh, uh, servers need to access the same files. So you have a locking mechanism that makes sure that you cannot uh, have two uh, servers writing to the same file at the same time at the risk of uh, corrupting the data. So both the hardware and the protocol is slower uh, when you go through the network. Okay. Don't see other questions. So, um, this is a graph where you can. You, this is a picture or figure where it, that you can refer to if you don't know which mass storage, which storage system to use, uh, for instance. But as as I said earlier, uh, Ariel will give a special session dedicated to this specifically this afternoon. So after file systems, uh, we can discuss file formats because. The fact that you have a file system means that you need to store files and files have formats. You need to decide how to read it and how to uh, access it and understand the contents. So here I will go a bit through multiple file formats so that you can decide which one to use for your applications. So uh, text file formats are the one that are the most known. So it's a type of file format that you can see uh, most of the time for small data and uh, the type of file that you can read readily with a text editor or even with a cat command on the, on the Linux system. So the most used uh, types are JSON, 
dot any the XML, the YAML, sorry, and the XML. So you see they all have a structure. This looks like a dictionary in uh, JavaScript. This looks like um, a very readable format for humans when you have keys and then values. Uh, this is also a key value where you have uh, sections. You see here that you can have lists that are organized, and so it's readily understandable by the human, but it's also very easy for the system to parse. And here, XML is redesigned to be consumed or produced by automatic system because there's a lot of overhead, and not, most of the time it's not easy to understand exactly the content just by looking at the XML. Uh, from a human point of view, but it's uh, still doable because it's always uh, text. So this is the type of file format that you will see a lot. And the nice thing is that for any of those file formats, for any language that you might use, uh, there are tools to uh, read uh, libraries, to read them, to write them, to uh, modify them and so forth. So if you see a file system that looks like this, uh, sorry, a file that looks like this. Do not try to write the code to modify it. Just do use the library that does it. Another type of file system, which is, uh, sorry, a file format that is often seen is the CSV, so comma separated value. So uh, again, it's a text file system, but where you can store data. And typically, if you use Excel, you know that you can export the sheets in Excel in comma separated values files. Uh, and these are very portable because it's only text. So you don't have information about the size of the columns or the colors or whatever, but the data is there, it's text, and you can manipulate it uh, with a simple text editor or even look at its content with a cut and past and head and tail comments from uh, Linux. So it's nice when you have a few data uh, because it's readily uh, readable. But if you have larger data, you need to use a binary file system, uh, binary file format, <clears throat> such as, for instance, uh, CDF or HDF. So this is not a text file format. If you try to see its content, you will only see uh, information which you, you will not be able to interpret. But if you are using the correct tools uh, inside this type of uh, uh, file formats, you have data which can be multidimensional. It's not necessarily a uh, matrix or a table like with a CSV files. And you can have multiple data, multiple uh, tables in there with uh, also additional information. So you can have uh, time series, uh, for instance, or field, tensor fields stored in the file system, in the file form, in the file, along with information about when the uh, information was gathered or some additional information that you want to keep with the data or ownership, who has uh, created the file and so on. And so if you want to use this, the HDF group, for instance, offers libraries that you can use in any language to, um, uh, in many languages, not all languages, but in most of the languages that you will use on the cluster, you will be able to create and read HDF5 files. And you see that it goes a bit like opening a regular file uh, in this C example, you have a line where you open the file and then you choose a data set in the file because you can have multiple matrices or tensors in the file. You need to choose one and then <clears throat> you have function like this to write to the file and to read from the file. So uh, it takes uh, a few arguments, which I'm go not, gonna to, uh, not going to, to explain, but you see that basically you have pointers here to the data that you want to store. When you save an HDF file, you can use library, but you can also use uh, command line tools. So you have the HDF file, the H5 dump command or import. Uh, this one shows you the content of a file, and this one allows you to create a file from both a, for instance, data file. So here you have uh, what could be a comma separated value file. And then here you have additional information that I want to associate to this file, to this data, such as the dimension, the type, which is floating point or integer, the size. So uh, 
double precision, signal precision, the byte order also if needed. And then with this file plus this file, with this command, you merge them into a single file that has both the data and additional information about the data in a single file. And then that file uh, is also a very efficient so storage system, much more efficient than uh, CSV because the data can be uh, is binary encoded and it's also compressed if you if you need to. So now the question is what file format to use for what usage? Uh, and here again, you can have sort of a uh, summary when you can refer to when you don't know what file format to use. Basically for metadata, so things that are not uh, the pure data, most of the time you will find any or YAML very useful because they are very easy to write by hand and to understand by uh, reading it. If you have a bit more complex data to store, JSON is the best way to go because uh, with YAML you can store entire dictionaries and so on, but the language is a bit underspecified and there are corner cases, corner cases where uh, you will not understand exactly how YAML will pass the information that you put in the file, but JSON uh, is a bit more verbose. You, you need more characters uh, extra to uh, create the structure, but in the end, you are sure that what you describe in the JSON is exactly how the machine will understand it. So YAML and E are very nice for human rated uh, information. JSON is better for uh, things that are a bit more complex, written and read or consumed by a uh, uh, software. So for data, you can go with uh, comma separated value files if you want, and you have small data in the order of kilobytes. If you have more data, you can also compress the CSV. Some oftentimes uh, when you have large CSV, you can compress them and you can have tools that uncompress on the fly if you need to read it and you don't want to store the entire uh, part on the disk. And then if we have the order of gigabytes, uh, this does not be, uh, this is not manageable easily anymore. And then you can use uh, NetCDF, HDF5 or DXMF uh, to uh, store the data in a compressed way and in a way that you can easily access part of the data directly using the libraries. Now, if you have on the order of terabytes per file uh, data, then you need to have a look at databases and object stores. Uh, but here we often talk about the loss of innocence because you are entering a completely different paradigm and it's not just a matter of reading and uh, opening a file. Uh, so I hope this helps you understand which file format you should use for which type of uh, data. If you have any question on that, do not hesitate uh, to ask them on the on the Q and on the chat. So uh, this was about file system and uh, file formats, and now I will move on to the object storage. So, as I said a bit earlier, object storage is quite of a new technology that is emerging. It was originated, it has or originated from the cloud um, uh, world. Most uh, so it's most used in web applications, but we can see that it's coming uh, closer and closer to the scientific world. So three known examples are Swift S3, which is linked to Amazon and Ceph, which is open source. So here at the UC Louvain for the uh, HPC uh, group, we have installed a Ceph cluster that we use for our um, management systems. It has a large number of features that are very nice from the administrator's point of view, but also from the user's point of view. The fact that it's accessible through a REST API, so through the web, means that you can store your data in a object storage and then access it from mostly anywhere in the world. It could be a cluster, it could be your, files, your um, laptop, it could be a uh, a laptop of a colleague, you can share it very easily. And basically, the way you use you use that is a bit like how you access to 
a, a web page on the web. So here is an example of how to connect to an object store. So here is S3 uh, in Python. You see that I need an access key and a secret key. Uh, this identifies the uh, user and this uh, is the way to authenticate. And then you need to create a connection where you specify the access key, the secret key, the host, so the name of the machine that holds your data. Uh, you can specify a port or leave the default port. And then here uh, you need to give some additional information about the, the uh, protocol that you want to use. Most of the time it's not needed, but depending on the version of the library you are using and the version of the um, uh, software installed on the object store, you might need to specify additional information, but then you can create a connection to uh, what we call the bucket. So you can think of a bucket as a home directory for a specific user. And then inside the bucket, you can store data where you first define a key and then you can set contents associated to the key. So here I create a new key, let's say hello.txt. I just give it the name I want. Here I give it a name that looks like a text file. And then I set the contents based on a single string. So in the end, I will have a hello.txt object that contains uh, this. And then I can set metadata. And here, for instance, I can say that the owner is the author, but I actually get to choose which metadata I want to associate to the, to the object. And not all objects need to have the same metadata uh, structure. Here is another example where I simply upload an existing file from the file system to uh, the bucket. So I create a new key and I set the contents from the file name. <clears throat> Once I have those objects into my object store, I can get a, uh, I can retrieve the key from an object. So here I had a key, uh, hello.txt, and I want to access the object linked to the key. I can just say, okay, give me the key to this object with the name, and then I can get a URL by this function, for instance, and it has some uh, parameters where you can specify an authentication scheme and so on. But basically, once you have done that, you can share through the web. You see here, I opened a tab in uh, Firefox, and with this information and the fact that I created a URL in the object store, I'm able to download the, the object, and you see that here, what Firefox would suggest is to take the object and create a file named hello.txt with, uh, and it would be a document with the contents that are the contents of the object in the object store. So nice thing about object stores is that you can write data in them and then collect the data from <clears throat> anywhere in the world. You don't need to have the object store mounted in a way uh, on the cluster there, or you don't need to have SSH access to it. You can share data with this to people uh, that you want. Just they just need to have network access to the object store. So the other important thing about the object store is that you can tag the data. You can uh, set metadata with the object. So with files, the set of metadata is fixed. You cannot change it. Is owner permissions type of uh, file and so on. Here you actually get to choose the keys and the values that you want to associate to the object. So you see here an example with project equals blue or classification equals PHI. You, you get to decide uh, what type of additional information you store alongside the object. And the nice thing is that you can query the object store based on the metadata. So if you are if you are organized, you can uh, <clears throat> very easily set up an object store where you have a large data and information that allows you to find the correct file name directly based on the metadata that you uh, want to, to find. Otherwise, if you have large directories with uh, files and subdirectories and so on, 
uh, sometimes you will have to crawl through all files to find the one that you uh, want to, to find if you do not have the name exactly, but you know features of the file that you want to, to find. Uh, here, if you set the feature as metadata, you can query the system up about the features and get the file uh, very easily uh, directly from the object store. But it's much more used for a one read, one write, multiple read, by contrast with a file system where it's meant to have uh, write and read in the same amount of um, uh, in the same amounts. It's not designed specifically for writing or for reading. Uh, this is more designed to be a one write, multiple read uh, system. So again, this is not available to users now, but more and more if you start working with Amazon uh, AWS or if you start uh, thinking about better way to store your data, this is something that you might want to investigate a bit. And then besides the file systems, the object stores, we have the databases. So the databases, is, databases are also in a very old technology. Uh, it's mostly uh, used behind websites or uh, administrative software. It's mostly used for categorical data and alphanumerical data. So it's not pretty suited for matrices, but it's good for end results, for instance. Uh, it makes finding a data element very fast because there are a lot of ways you can compute indexes that allow you to find uh, one row in a very large amount of uh, rows very easily. Uh, and uh, data database management systems also, also have a lot of uh, pre-coded functionalities to compute sums or extract maximum or minimum from data. The RDBMS also encodes relationships between data. So if you have multiple tables, you can have links between the rows and the columns of the tables so that you can have um, data which is organized in a structured way. It has nice features. Uh, so the theory says it's uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So it's a, it's a way to say that basically you will have something that lasts in time and is always uh, consistent. I see, I show here some uh, example, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres are the most uh, used types of RDBMS, uh, but of course they need a server that acts as a database system, um, but uh, SQLite and DuckDB uh, are things that you will be able to use without a server. So just a few words to explain a bit more. So data is stored in tables where you have attributes and tuples or records. And so here is an example with uh, three columns and three lines. The names are login first and last. And you see here, this can be set as a, a key that links to another table, another line in another table. And so from there, you have here information about the name of someone and here you have phone numbers and you have relation between the phone number and the person. And the way you access those uh, information is by using a language that is called SQL that looks like this. So you can create table users and then you specify the columns with the types here. Varchar means basically text. And then you can insert into a table some values like here. If I run insert into users values Mark Samuel Clements, I will get this first line here created. And then you can uh, query the system with a select. So you can select first and last, which are the first and last here, uh, from users, so this table, and then where login equals lion. And so if you run this, you will get uh, this line. And you can have billions of lines, this type of query, if there's an index on uh, uh, this column, this type of query will be very, very fast. And then you can use join to uh, get information about two tables at the same time. So here, select login phone. So login is this and phone is this uh, from users. So this table 
join on phone number, so this table, and then you specify that user.login must be equal to phone.login, so this is the link. And then you can have uh, a uh, vision of the table with the login and then first, last, and telephone and phone all on the same page. Actually, I should add here first and last to have all the columns. Uh, and the database system is really designed to make this kind of operation very fast. And so if you have a large number of results which you need to organize, you can think about putting them in a, uh, a structured way like this, and then you will be able to query the results very fast. But as I said, this requires a file system to be installed, uh, sorry, a database system to be installed, uh, and this requires resources which you might not have. So uh, if you want, you can use SQLite or DuckDB, which offer nearly the same set of features as a uh, MySQL server or a uh, <coughs> PostgreSQL server, but it's simply based on files. And so you can run selects and so on based on files. It has both a command line interface when you have a SQLite 3 a command line that allows um, querying or creating data. And then there are also APIs in most languages. So most of the typical languages you might find on a cluster have a SQLite uh, at least uh, libraries which you can use instead of use of opening a file. You can use uh, the SQLite library to open a connection to the database. And this is much more efficient in terms of file system than writing a million small files. So imagine that you have a large amount of, of jobs that produce a single result. Uh, it's much more efficient to store that single result into an SQLite database than in a large number of files, both from the file system's point of view, because if you store files with a single number in, the, in them, you will consume a lot of file nodes um, and you will actually use more space in the inode space than in the volume space. And then if you need to find some specific value, if you have it all in a SQL uh, database, it's much faster than if you have to open and read a large number of files just to find the value that you need. Nice thing about SQLite and the database system is also that if you have a problem, if you have a crash somewhere, uh, you know that at least the data which is available on the SQLite system is consistent. It might not be complete, but it will not be corrupted uh, and you will not have uh, partial data because of the ACID properties I was talking about uh, a bit earlier. So this uh, was a very quick introduction to database systems. And just to let you know that, for instance, SQL, SQLite might be a very good candidate to store large amount of small results rather than having a collection <coughs> of uh, small files. As I said, this is an old technology and there are more recent technology that are called NoSQL, uh, mostly for data which has another structure than simply uh, a table. For instance, you have key value stores uh, where you have a system that exactly works like a, a dictionary in Python or a mapping in PHP or an array in Bash uh, and so on. You have databases that are designed to hold graphs. You know that sometimes the information, for instance, in a social network, uh, does not come as a set of as a matrix, but rather as a graph that has node, nodes and edges, and you can transform that graph into a matrix, legacy matrix or another type of matrix. But it's less efficient than storing the graph directly as a graph into a graph database. You have column databases because, as I said earlier, um, the tables in the uh, so the database classical database they hold tables, but they are made so that the query of a uh, row or a record in the table is very fast. And these column tables are organized the other way around, where you can manipulate columns very much faster than rows. And this is the type of uh, um, database which is nice for uh, data analysis, machine learning, big data and so on. And then you have document 
databases where basically you uh, store documents most of the time in forms of a JSON document. So you can have a Python object or a C++ object and directly store them in the document database uh, without the need to think about transforming the object into a uh, form that is suitable for the table. Uh, for instance, they have another set of features, so it's not ACID. They chose basic by contrast. Um, basically, it says that it's also highly available, but you don't have the same uh, constraints as uh, with the asset properties. Uh, I will not discuss this further, but basically you, you need to understand that you might here lose some data if you uh, want to in, a, in if you want to uh, have the performances a bit better. Here again, just like for the regular databases, you have to have a server that has this service running. Uh, but here again, there are systems like uh, TinyDB where you can have, this is a, a document store, uh, simply as a, as a file on your file system in the cluster. Uh, but then again, you can use the APIs or the command line interface to put documents in the TinyDB and to read from it. Again here, same use cases with SQLite. If you have a large number of uh, small items of data that comes for, from, uh, for instance, a large number of jobs that produce a small uh, result, you can store them in the tiny DB rather than uh, uh, writing a large amount of small files. And this brings me to uh, when to use a database. Databases are meant really for a large number of uh, re writes and reads uh, at the same time. So as I said earlier, the object store is much more designed for one write, multiple reads. Uh, here we are a bit at the opposite with uh, really designed for multiple reads at the same time, multiple writes, sorry, at the same times, uh, along with uh, several reads. So if you have a large number of small files, you can think about putting that into a database. If you perform a lot of direct writes in a large file. So if you have a large file and you write at some places and not uh, in a stream way, you can think that maybe a database is a better uh, suited system. If your data is structured and you want to keep the structure, if it's a graph or if it's table with links between tables and uh, constraints, then you can think about a database. And also when your program has a non-negligible probability of crashing, uh, it will be uh, safer if you store it in a database system than on a file, in a file system. And then if you have concurrent access to the information, so if you have files that are updated by several processes, you always have the risk of a collision or a, um, a, a corruption of the file. While with the database system, it was designed to work like this. Just to show you an example, uh, this is taken from the uh, NFS documentation uh, and it says explicitly here that uh, when you try to write on a system in the on a, on a file sorry and a NFS file system so the same file system that is used on the home directories and clusters from two different uh, locations to the same file you can end up with corruptions. Now we'll just show you an example here. Uh, I run this a, quite a long time ago on HMM, but basically it's valid for any other cluster. Uh, you see here I use SALOC, uh, so I'm sure you, you all know about Slurm on the cluster, system that is used to uh, allocate jobs, allocate uh, resources to jobs. With SALOC dash dash nodes 4, I am requesting the scheduler to give me four uh, nodes and I got those four nodes and then I use srun to create many job steps. So you see that I will create uh, on each of the uh, machine a bash process that will loop to this number and it will write into some file and the file is on the NFS file system so it's the same for, for all the processes that run on the four uh, compute node. And so if I look at what I have in the head 
in the uh, test file, I see that I first have um, the slump proc ID. So it would be 0, 1, 2, or 3 because I have four nodes. And then I will have here um, the number i, which is the one here. So what I'm expecting to expecting to see is 0, 1, 2, or 3, followed by a number like this. And indeed, the head of the file shows me this. But then if I look closer inside the file and I uh, remove with egrep-v anything that looks like what I am expecting, I see that there are also large amount of lines which do not have the requested value. And you see here, this, this, here you only have one number, if you have three numbers, here you have even more numbers. So uh, it means that the um, file has been written at the same time and the, the information has been mixed up all the way around. So just a small um, example, which you can reproduce on basically any cluster. You should try to write from multiple compute nodes into the same file on NFS. You can end up with files that have a code problem. <coughs> and in that case, the database is most probably the way to go. When the database is not the way to go, when you have only sequential access, rather than direct access. If you have a large file and you need to read the file from A to Z in one go, the database will not bring anything interesting. If you have a simple vector of a multiple, again, here the files in a HDF file file are much more efficient. Or if you have to, uh, adapt to, to have direct access on fixed size records and there are no structure, here again, a GF5 is the way to go. Okay, so this was a, uh, all I wanted to talk to you about uh, data storage. Do not hesitate to ask questions if you have. Uh, but then I will move on to the second part, which is about data transfer. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing about data transfer is about the, the technologies. Just to making sure you are uh, aware that <clears throat> from your laptop <clears throat> to a compute node, there are different types of networks that are uh, in place and they all have different performances. So typically from your laptop to the building switch, you have a 100 megabits per second connection. And then from the building switch to the data center switch, you have most probably a 10 gigabits connection from the data center switch to the cluster front end, uh, for instance, on the MET3, we have a one gigabit connection. And then from the cluster front end to the compute head, compute node, we have uh, in the order of 100 gigabits per second. Of course, the bottleneck will most often be your connection to the uh, switching, build, to the building switch. So if you have data to move around uh, and it's on your laptop, sometimes it's more efficient to bring us a USB uh, disk and then we plug in the USB disk directly on the storage system and move the data from there rather than having to go through the uh, slowest link of your laptop. So the typical uh, tool that you will use to, to move data from one computer to another is SCP, as you have learned about in the uh, SSH session. So the typical way <clears throat> to do that is use SCP and then a local name and then the name of a compute node or a remote machine colon then the directory where you put the file that you copy. You can do it also the other way around if you need to copy data in the other uh, direction. It's the most direct way to copy data to and from Unix systems. Uh, but it's also inefficient for two reasons. First, it's only sequential, but it will uh, use one uh, file at a time and it's uh, synchronous. And actually the SCP protocol has a large amount of uh, um, synchronous operations in the protocol. So where, when a, a bunch of data is copied to the remote machine, 
SCP waits for the confirmation that the bunch of data is correctly arrived before, pro before uh, proceeding with the rest of the file. And so it's a protocol that is uh, mostly being abandoned now, because if you look at the uh, documentation for OpenSSH 8, one of the latest versions, you see they say that SCP is outdated, inflexible, and not readily fixed. So they are uh, preparing the uh, phasing out of the SCP command and the SCP protocol. So what you can do uh, if SCP is not good enough, you can use SFTP. So SFTP is the equivalent or the modern equivalent of FTP. So the way it works is that you start a session with SFTP and then the name of a machine here, LM3 uh, refers to limit three. And then it says, okay, I'm connected. And I have a number of commands that I can use. And you see CD allows changing the directory, just like if you were in a bash session, but you also have an LCD for local CD. When you run CD by default, it's a CD command that you run on the remote machine. And LCD is a command that you run on a local machine. And again, uh, LLS is an LS running on the local machine and LS is an LS running on the remote machine. And then you have the uh, get and put commands. So the get here and the put here commands that tell you that allow you transferring file to and from the remote system. So it works a bit different than uh, SF than SCP, but if you have a large file, uh, this most probably will be a bit faster than using SCP if you want to transfer the data. If you have a large number of files, another tool which is very interesting and you've, you've learned a bit about it in the Linux session is rsync. So if you have uh, two directories, you want to synchronize the contents of the directories. You can use SFTP for first copy, but then if you have files that change on the source, on the origin, and you want the files to change in the same way on the target, you can use rsync, and rsync will make sure that only the changes that have been uh, applied on the local part are transferred to the remote part, so that any data that did not change will not uh, be copied through the network again. Uh, so the AirSync works like this. You see it's the same syntax with uh, host colon destination and uh, with the sources here and it can be the other way around if you want to pull data from the remote locations. Uh, you should always use AZ uh, <coughs> uh, with AirSync, otherwise it is not recursive, it does not preserve ownership and so on. And then a uh, very nice thing is to use dash dash progress, which will show you a progress bar uh, of the, <coughs> the synchronization. You have options to include or exclude file types, file patterns. If you have temporary data you don't want to uh, rsync them, you can use that dash exclude. And you can have the delete or remove source file if you want to uh, also reproduce the deletion of files. So if you use rsync from one file system to another and you suppress a file from the origin file system, rsync will not suppress a file on the destination file system except if you use uh, dash dash delete. And if you use a dash dash remote source file, it will move the data rather than copying the data. Nice thing also is dry run. If you are not sure that you wrote the command line correctly and you don't want to end up <coughs> uh, moving more data than necessary or duplicating files, you can use a dash dash dry run option to see what rsync, what files rsync would copy or synchronize to the other um, file system. And then you can decide if you run it without dry run or if you want to add some more uh, options such as include, exclude and so on <clears throat> to make sure that only the files that you want to be copied are copied. And then uh, you can also use dash dash size only or that dash checksum because by default um, rsync would look at the contents as a hashed contents of the files to decide whether it should be copied back to the uh, destination. But if you know that the files didn't change, but uh, you know that there might be some new files, 
uh, you can use the size only so that uh, uh, rsync will make the decision to transfer file from the location to the remote location based on the size rather than based on the content. Rsync also has options to, uh, to uh, resume copies. If you have started a copy of a large file with a CP, let's say, uh, and then you lost a network in the middle, you can use rsync dash dash in place to restart exactly where you stopped with SCP. So here is an example. I'm connected to the manback cluster and I want to copy this file, which is a bit large, to uh, the LM9 machine, which is an old machine, into the slash TMP uh, folder. And then you see when it arrives at uh, 58%, I killed it with control C. And I uh, uh, use rsync now. And you see that it will it takes eight seconds. But if I do the same, I copy, I cancel, and then I use dash dash append. So I said I talked about in place, but I, I was referring to dash dash append. Uh, you see it takes less time. Only one second compared to eight seconds. So if you, you, you are using SCP and it crashes in the middle, you can use dash dash, dash append or sync with dash dash append and it will uh, only copy the part of the file that was not yet copied. Here I talk about in place because actually the way AirSync works is that if you uh, move a file, it will first move the file into a hidden file and then it will transfer, move, uh, rename the file to the correct name. But if you do that and the transfer is interrupted, the uh, temporary file is destroyed. So uh, the way to avoid that is to use rsync dash dash in place. And if you use rsync dash dash in place, you will see that the file with the correct name directly grows in, in size uh, as long as the rsync command is running. And so if the rsync command is interrupted, then you can restart it with uh, dash dash append to uh, resume exactly in the file where you were uh, stopped. So rsync uh, can be used to uh, synchronize directories, making sure that you only transfer the data that you want. The weak point of rsync is the metadata. If you have a large number of uh, files, rsync will go through each file and decide whether it has changed or not. And even uh, if the directory where you want to put the data is empty, uh, there will be a large overhead with the rsync. And so to avoid that overhead, what you can do is first uh, create a table archive where you drastically reduce the number of metadata inodes um, and then transfer the table to the location where you want the data to be and then untar the, the data there. And you don't need to first create the table, then copy the table and uh, expand the table. You can do it in all one way with uh, an example like this. So from local to remote with a tar command. Uh, oh, it should be a C here, CVZF. Uh, this dash means that you want the uh, file to be created actually not as a file but in the standard output and then the path the data you want to copy and you pipe it into SSH to some server with cat to a certain file and so this will on the file uh, gather all files in this directory create a tar archive transfer it through SSH to this server and run this command so that at the end this file is created with the content of uh, this uh, directory. And then here, if you replace cat with a tar uh, x vzf, then you have the directory structure which is recreated. If you want to do it the other way around, it's just a matter of running SSH here rather than here. Uh, 
and it actually avoids a lot of the communication overhead uh, linked to DI nodes. So it's better than AirSync for the first transfer of a large number of small files. Also, you can use the PV command uh, to get a progress bar. So here, if you replace cat with PV, or here, if you uh, insert a pipe and PV here, you will get a progress bar of the, 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 the process. So you will know uh, <coughs> the, the, the speed at which the data is being transferred, and you will know approximately when it will stop. So question is, how does it look when the destination is in another machine? So it looks like this. You use SSH to, uh, to connect to the other machine and then use either cat if you want to create it all in a file or tar, tar again here at this place if you want to recreate the structure. Uh, and you can put SSH here if you want from remote to local or here if you want to local uh, okay, so this is uh, all of this was about uh, being efficient in transferring files with a single stream of data, but you can try to use multiple streams of data at the same time. The rationale is that when you need to transfer data from one computer to another, uh, <clears throat> you first need to read from the disk and then to push through the network on one computer and then on the other computer you need to read from the network and then write to the disk. And when to, you write to disk, uh, <clears throat> actually if you get more data from the network you would need to store them in memory and so uh, most of the time the process will just say okay don't send me more data at this time. So what you can do is try to have multiple processes reading from disk and sending data so that when one is reading from the disk, the other can has already read and can send the data through the network. And then when the data is sent, it can read from the disk while the other sends through the network. So it, it's a bit more complicated than that in, real, in uh, the real life, but the idea is that one. So here you can, uh, <clears throat> I will mention a tool called BBCP. Uh, it's very easy to install. It's not installed by default on Linux, but you can really easily install it even on the cluster because you don't need to be root to have root access to install it. Uh, but it needs friendly firewalls. So most of the time it will work between computers that are on the same network. But if you have to go through m multiple networks, uh, it will not work. So for instance, from going for going from one cluster to another cluster in another university, it will not work. But otherwise, if it works, you can replace the SCP with a BBCP and you see here dash capital P2 means use two processes. Uh, and you see I can go in this example from 13 seconds to 9 seconds uh, on the same hardware. So the disk is not faster, the network is not faster. But simply the fact that I'm interleaving two different processes, I'm, I'm able to use the bandwidth available. Uh, much more. So you see here uh, I'm topped at 50 megabyte per second and here I can go uh, double that and I actually reach the theoretical limit of a gigabit link. So just like BBCP is a way to transfer data in parallel like SCP, you can use uh, parsing FP to run rsync in parallel. So again, here parsing FP is not readily installed on all clusters, but it's a, a simple Perl uh, script, and you have the reference in the at the bottom of the slide here. So you can uh, install it very easily in your home directory, and you can again decide the number of uh, processes to run, and you see here <coughs> the output it will give you. And uh, again, this is a way to create multiple rsync at the same time and make sure that the bandwidth that you have available from the hardware is used the best possible. Uh, <coughs> if you are not able to install parsing you can uh, also use GNU parallel along with rsync and actually 
uh, in the GNU parallel documentation, there's an example exactly on how to parallelize our sync. So if you attended the session about parallel computing, you know a bit about GNU parallel, but GNU parallel is a software to um, uh, run processes in parallel and have gives you a large a lot of control over the creation of those pilot processes. But here you see an example where basically uh, they use find the find command to file all file to find all files in the current directory and they pipe that into parallel and they say okay create 10 processes and each process will run rsync with the file that was uh, discovered to this location. And even though this, this will create a bit more overhead than if you use one single rsync command uh, on all the files, the fact that you create 10 of them in parallel uh, will be faster than simply having one of them. You can, as I write here, limit the depth of find because here you see that there's no restriction. Uh, so if you want, you can here say max depth equals two or three, for instance, and then uh, each rsync command will take care of, a, of an entire subdirectory rather than a secret file. And you have a sweet spot between um, having rsync handle a large or small amount of files and creating a large amount of rsync instances. There's a, there's a trade off there. Uh, there's no obvious solution, but if you try, you can play with uh, the depth of the find command and the number of are a parallel are seen to create to see which what which one solution works best uh, for you. So uh, this section was about transferring data, tools that you might find useful to transfer data and to speed up the transfer, either going parallel with the uh, power of sync FP or new parallel and our sync or using BBCP if you are able to. And then uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that if you have a very large number of files, uh, you should try to use the tar and pipe it through SSA to transfer it to some other computer in a way that will avoid a large, large amount of overhead uh, related to the inodes and so on, especially for a first transfer. So if you don't have any uh, questions about that second part, I will uh, go through the third part, which is about uh, data sharing. Most of the time you have data, you produce data or you consume data, you need to get data from other users or other people in the world, or you need to transfer the result and uh, communicate the result with other people. We will see here some tools to do that. And first, uh, we'll see how to share data with other users on the same system. And then we'll see how to share the data with other users on other systems, with external users who do not have a CC account or are not in Belgium or are not from uh, one of the universities. So how do you uh, share data with other users? The uh, thing is the Unix permission. You need to understand how Unix permission work and you need to play with them to share your data. Here is an example on some machine uh, where with the id command, which is available on any, on any Linux system, I have uh, my group, my user id, and then it shows me my primary group and the secondary groups. So as a user, I belong to multiple groups. And the fact that I, sh I am part of a group allows me to share data with other users that are part of the group, the same group. So here I will show you how to do that. First, I will create a test directory and I will change the permission so that the test directory is seven, so read and write executable by me, and five, so readable and executable by others, but not writable by others of the same group, but not writable. And then the zero here says, OK, it's not readable nor writable by other people. If I uh, use ls-l, and ll is a, a small shortcut here, you see I have read, write, execute for me, 
read, not write, execute for the group, and nothing, nothing, nothing for um, the other that are not part of the group. So when I create a directory, by default, it is assigned my primary group. So here you see it's GRP pan, my primary group. Then I can use as a regular user chgrp command, change group to say, okay, I want this directory to actually belong to this group. When I run that command, if I run ls, I see that here it's grprcfv rather than grp pan. And now all the people who are, who are in this group have a read and executable access on the directory. So actually the executable access on the directory means that the user is able to traverse the directory. It has nothing to do with uh, regular files where this X says that the file can be executed. Uh, here is the same X, but it means that you can traverse it. Uh, <clears throat> and then a second thing that you might find useful is that Actually, when you create a file here with a touch command, I create a file in this directory. Uh, you see that here again, when I create a file, it's my primary group that is assigned to the file. So I have a test file one assigned to uh, this group, my primary group, which is not why I, what I want. If I want to share the contents of the group, the contents of the file here with uh, this uh, group, uh, what I would like is that whenever I create a file in that group, in that directory, it is assigned directly to that group. And this can be done with the G, with the S option here. So with change mod G plus S, it says, okay, add the set group ID bit to uh, this directory. And then once, once I have done that, uh, if you use LS again to see what is the the permission you will see that the uh, X here has been replaced with an S. And then if I create another file, test file 2, you see that by default it has been assigned to GRP or CRV. So if you are, uh, if you have a group of users that are part of the same group, same Unix group, you can use uh, this kind of setup to share the, the um, the files between multiple users in the same group. And this uh, G plus S is the solution to make sure that whenever you create a file in a directory that you want to be shared, the file has the same group as the directory. And so it has the same uh, <coughs> access right as the directory. The thing is that if you um, if you want to share data with another user that is not part of the same group, you can simply make the file a word readable. So rather than change mod uh, 750, you can run it 755, and then the directory is word readable. But if you do not want this, what you can do is kind of in between is assigning the uh, X here, but not the R. So it means that me, I can read, write, and traverse. Use, uh, users of the same group can read, not write, but also traverse. And users from not the same group can neither read, neither write, but they can traverse. So what this allows is that if you have a file like this one, which is readable by others, uh, it, it has some contents. If I am someone else on the same system, even though I'm not able to see what is inside the directory of this user, so this is DFR, if I look into the directory of DFR, you see cannot open directory permission denied. This is because there's no R here. But if me as DFR, I say, okay, in my home directory, there's a file named minimal.c. Uh, then this user, because there's a X here, which is activated, is able to see the content of the file. So the user is not able to 
change directory to the home directory of my DFR user. It's not allo allowed to look into the directory contents, but if I give it the name explicitly of a file uh, and the file has the correct permissions, then the other user can have a look at the file. So you can have a directory in some you, inside your home with this uh, kind of uh, permission pattern and it be aware that the home, the, the parent directory also must have this kind of permission pattern, otherwise it will be blocked at the home directory. Uh, but then if you do that, you are able to share files with others by specifying to them and sharing with them the correct location of the file. They will be able to read it, even though they are not able to change the directory to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the directory. So if uh, this is not enough for you and you want not only uh, to hide, but also make sure that the other people, even the system administrators are not able to read it, read the file, uh, you can um, uh, encrypt the file, of course. So again, here I have a, a file named minima.c. I can use OpenSSL, which is a command mostly installed in all uh, Linux systems. I specify here the type of encryption that I want. Uh, so you can use this one by default and then the name of the file you want to encrypt and the name of the file you want to be created. So it's uh, when you run this command, it's asking for a password, which you need to provide two times. Of course, do not lose that password because the ones you lose the content of the file. And then it creates this file and you see that the content is pure garbage. You can't uh, understand what's in there. Once you have done that, you can just delete this file and you have stored your file in an encrypted way on your file system. Uh, and then you can uncompress it, uh, sorry, unencrypt it with the other operation. So it's the same set of commands rather, but you have a dash D here and the dash in and dash out is in the other order. It's asking for the password, the one which was chosen here, and then you can retrieve the contents of the files. So if you want to share data with the other users and you make sure that only a specific user can access it, what you do is you uh, encrypt it, you make it world readable on the system, and then you give the encryption key to the people you want to be able to access the file. And then those people can read the encrypted file and then decrypt it <clears throat> with the OpenSSL command. And those who have not access to the uh, encryption password are not able to decrypt the content. So they can see the content if you put it worldwide readable, but they will not have access uh, the content. OK, so this was about uh, sharing data on the same system by playing with the permissions, group permissions, world permissions, uh, making a directory traversable but not readable, and also encrypted encrypting files so that you can give access to a file to some users on. Now I go to the second part of this part, which is about uh, sharing data with external users. If you have collaborators which are not part of CC, they do not have access to the CC file systems or to the CISM or PTCY, or whatever <coughs> uh, systems, and you need to transfer data across the network and give them access. One tool that you can use, and it's available in some of the universities, uh, is Nextcloud. So here at UCLouvain, <coughs> we have a Nextcloud instance running. The Nextcloud is uh, accessible in UCLouvain with a CISM login, so it's specific to UCLouvain. But uh, with that, actually, uh, you can have a system which looks exactly like Dropbox. I'm sure you know about Dropbox or Google Drive. You know that it's a system where you can share uh, your data in the cloud and you have uh, a directory on your machine where you can copy data and then if you copy data to your Dropbox directory, it's uh, available on the cloud somewhere and you can retrieve it on your smartphone or other computer where you are connected to the same Dropbox. And for every uh, file in Dropbox or Google Drive, you can create a link that allows you sharing the file with people uh, through the network. 
here it works exactly the same. So if you go to uh, Dropbox, uh, sorry, to Nextcloud, you see something like this. Uh, so it, it really looks like the the Dropbox interface. You have your files here. Nice thing is that uh, Nextcloud allows uh, connecting to other storage. So in Nextcloud, you have some storage, not a large amount of storage, but you can connect to clusters or to um, uh, storage systems. So here in my Dropbox, I have a connector to my storage account on the mass storage. And with that, which is defined like this, so I specify that storage is an SFTP. You remember SFTP? I was talking about a bit earlier. Um, <clears throat> I need to give the name of the machine, my username, my password, and my home directory. And when I do that, you see that here I have a storage part that appears here. And same here with Manback, which is one of the clusters that we have here in Nouveau And so if I click on Manback, you see that I have some files available here, which, has ex which are exactly the same files uh, that are available in my home directory on the Manback cluster. And then the nice thing about that is that I can click to the share uh, button to the share option here for file. So here I have a file, I click share, and then I have the option to create a share link. And this link, I will be able to give it to other people. So I can protect the link with a password and set an expiration date. But then I can uh, give the name of the link and the password to any user, uh, any uh, other collaborator in the world, and they will be able to download simply by clicking on the link, they will arrive to a page like this and they have here the opportunity to download the file. So even though the file <clears throat> is, for instance, in your uh, storage space on the mass storage where you should, where you can only access with a CISM account and your CISM password, with this, you can actually share that file to anybody in the world uh, just by creating a share URL, giving the URL and then um, uh, if you want, you can add a password. So you can protect the download, but most of the time, simply the URL is already uh, hard enough to, to guess so that it can act as a password. But basically, this allows you to share files which are on a closed system with people who do not have access to that uh, closed system. So this is a, a very nice <clears throat> way to share data with collaborators of yours. Uh, there's another way to share data with other people. It's the uh, database. Again, it's something that is installed at Uselouva, but there are discussions to install it at the CC level. But basically, Dataverse is a way to share data linked to publications. So once you share data, in Dataverse, you get a unique identifier, a DOI, DOI uh, exactly the same type of identifier you have for uh, publications and which are uh, stored in Dial, for instance. Here, if you have data you want to share alongside the publication, you can put them in Dataverse. You get a unique identifier which you can refer to in your publication, and then you know that the data will be there for at least 10 or 15 years. It will always be accessible and the users, the uh, other people in the world who read your uh, paper, if they see that there's a diff reference to uh, some data set, they can click on the link and they will be brought to the page of the data set <clears throat> where they can download the data set and they have additional information. So uh, it's called a fair sharing of data, fair for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And the fact that it's interoperable uh, is what we are looking for when we try to set up a dataverse at the CC level. And so when the user, when uh, readers of your paper click on the DOI, they arrive to a page like this where they have uh, uh, files which they can download. So here I show a screenshot of a very early stage deployment of dataverse. So we only had one dataset 
and uh, it was our annual report because we didn't know what to, to share. Uh, but basically, you can simply <clears throat> upload there any data you want, and then it has some metadata information assigned to it, and most importantly, a DOI. So your data set is assigned a unique identifier where uh, you can that you can share with other people uh, in the world. And with that identifier, that single link, they will always be able to find your data on the data system. But again, this is only something which is available for uh, Uceluva users because you access it with your uh, portal account. Uh, but we are working together with the other CIS admins of the universities in CECI and, um, and uh, Belnet and so on to create a system which would uh, be available to all CC users. So, oops, sorry. In summary, uh, today I talked to you about storage, about how to choose the right file system and the right file format. Uh, and also I try to tell you that there are other uh, type of uh, uh, storage than file systems, database management systems and uh, object stores, and they are becoming uh, more and more available in the HPC world. Not yet at CC, but it could come at some point. Then I talked about transfers and how to use parallel tools when possible to transfer files. And also I explained how you can share data both on a system with other users on the same system uh, with the Unix permissions, and then also how to share data with people from other universities or anywhere in the world with uh, Nextcloud and uh, DataVerse. So this concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Uh, don't forget to answer the survey on Indico. And the uh, uh, last thing I wanted to say is that I will stay a bit longer to answer any questions you might have in the Q&A uh, part of the, of the feed, but we will stop the video now. So thank you for your participation.